Welcome to another interview with a wonderful Longwood Symphony musician. Today, I am joined by Dr. Psyche Louie. Psyche, thanks so much for being here. Hello. Well, thanks for having me. It's nice to see you. Of course. It's good to see your face again. I haven't seen you in almost two months now. So, yeah. So, um, Psyche, give us a little overview about what you do and, um, and who you are. What, who is Psyche? So Psyche Louie plays the violin in Longwood Symphony Orchestra. <clears throat> um, and I am also an assistant professor of creativity and creative practice in the Department of Music um, and affiliate um, professor in psychology at Northeastern University. Um, so I, I study music and the brain um, and the effects of music on health and well-being. Wow, so you are really really digging into how the brain functions when music is playing or when you are playing music. Yes, um, I would say that. I mean, we have projects that range from looking at children uh, and what music training might do for the child's brain and for the child's academic performance and, um, and cognitive performance. Um, and then all the way on the other end of the spectrum, we're looking at older adults as well, looking at what music therapy might do. Um, there's been some really striking examples of older adults, some with pretty advanced um, late stage dementia, um, not recognizing their family and so on. Uh, and then suddenly you play them music from a certain part of their youth and it's like, they're just on, right? Suddenly they, they just click on and they recognize everybody and they start talking um, and, and they're just in a totally different state. So I'm really interested in how that happens, why that happens, for whom does it happen? You know, what kind of dosage do we need for it to happen? You know, just really thinking about music um, as an a, as a ingredient, an active ingredient of, um, of health and well-being interventions. So how do you physically analyze these things? What kind of research methods do you use? So my lab's called Mind Lab, where Mind stands for Music, Imaging, and Neurodynamics. So the music part is clear to you. The, the imaging part um, mostly means magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. Right, so we have a, a MRI um, scanner and the same floor as the lab. Uh, and so what we do is we, when, when we have on-site testing, we have people come in for behavioral experiments. Sometimes we have them play on a piano that we have in the lab. And then we also bring them to the MRI to get their brain scanned. And we look at structural imaging as well as functional imaging. So what the brain is doing over time and how it's changing and how it's being used um, to listen to music and um, make aesthetic um, responses to music. And then also um, what the brain is like and how it's connected intrinsically. Um, we also, so the neurodynamics part of my mind lab, uh, um, that mainly refers to um, changes of brain activity over time. Uh, and the best way to capture that, um, or one of the best ways to capture that is um, using EEG or electroencephalography. So it's a bit like a swim cap with, for us, it's 64 channels that, um, of electrodes that are on the cap. And we put these caps on, um, on the participants um, and then we can observe their brain activity um, or electrical signals on the surface of their scalp um, as they're doing different cognitive and behavioral tasks. So listening to music, for example, uh, when you hear a musical chord that's a little bit unexpected, um, you get this very characteristic um, fluctuation in, in electrical potential. So it's really a brain response to musical expectancy. So it turns out that expectancy is a really key part of what we're looking at, um, because I think there's something about music that is really just a systematic way of um, catering to your expectations and then violate, violating your expectations and then those expectations and their violations become rewarding and become interesting and become why we seek out music um, to listen to over and over again. Um, so I'm very interested in that um, expectation and prediction mechanism um, and how we can measure that in the brain using different neuroimaging methods.
now that we are, or most of us are stuck at home, um, mm -hmm. how has all of that changed? I'm assuming you can't do any of the on-site researching. How, what are you doing instead? Right, so um, exactly, on-site research is all ground to a halt. Um, what we can do is we can keep analyzing existing data. So um, because these MRI scans especially are really quite expensive to get, um, there's been lots of worldwide efforts um, to share data and make them available online. Um, and so what we've been working on is um, collecting some of these freely open source, open, um, openly available uh, MRI scans, especially from older adults and also from younger adults, um, and, and then comparing them um, and then just looking at the connectivity patterns between the auditory system and the reward system. So with the idea that the, mu the reason why music is rewarding is because there's some patterns of firing, neuro firing of your auditory system um, that are um, coupled with the neuro firing patterns of your reward system. Um, and that's why um, you, the auditory input that is coming in as music um, ends up being rewarding and, and activating those reward centers of your brain. So, so that's actually, we're not actually um, collecting that data in the sense that we're not scanning those brains right now, but those are um, data that are already giving us that information, even though we didn't collect it ourselves. Um, we also have lots of online experiments going on. Um, so, you know, of course, because normally we would have um, college age students coming into our lab and doing these experiments, now they're all learning online. Uh, so the uh, experiments have also moved online. Um, so we've been using a few different online platforms. Um, a really nice one is called Gorilla. Um, and what we can do is we can put um, different experiments on there and we can re record their reaction time and we can still um, make um, make judgments about music and, and sounds. And, um, and so I think that's still very informative and useful. I'm just understanding behavior and how it relates to different sounds a little bit more. I'm curious um, if any of your research has explored different genres of music and how different people connect to, for instance, classical music versus pop music. Yeah, I think that there's um, an increasing body of research on it. And I'm, I've definitely looked at, um, for example, comparing um, improvising musicians, mostly jazz trained musicians, um, and non-improvising musicians, mostly classical trained musicians, uh, and looking at their differences in brain function and brain connectivity. Um, and what we're seeing is that there are these different modes of activity in the brain that are kind of brain networks that usually subserve different modes of cognition. Um, so a, a well-known one is called the default mode network. Um, and the default mode network is usually active when you're daydreaming or when you're thinking about yourself or when you're thinking about other people or just um, types of thinking that aren't really um, kind of on cue, right? Um, and then on the opposite side of it, um, there's the executive control network. Um, and that's a set of brain areas that are in, important when you're doing math, right? Or when you're, um, when you're making motor movements or when you're trying to pay attention, right? So those are um, uh, different parts of, um, of the brain, of brain networks. And what we're seeing is that um, jazz improvising musicians actually have more connectivity between those two networks. Um, so, and I think that fits quite well with how we think about um, how musical improvisation works, right? Is that in, in some sense, you are playing by the rules, right? So what comes out are notes and rhythms and note patterns that are, um, that are, you know, they're new, but they're not so different from other music that you might've heard before. Um, but then uh, you're also dipping into this kind of stream of consciousness um, of your um, of your experience, where sometimes you're thinking about yourself, and then you're you're kind of drawing on that um, uh, those memories and autobiographical information, and, and kind of uh, and, and funneling that information into the music as it comes out. So so I think this these two parts of the of the brain being 
um, being coupled together and working together um, to help you make music in real time um, is something that we've, we're, uh, we've seen. And, um, and now we're also looking at how training affects that, right? So do jazz musicians start out jazzier or do they become jazzier as a, uh, as a result of their training? Uh, and so far, what we're seeing is that um, they do change, these brains do change over time. Um, and oh, as, as jazz and classical musicians become more and more formed and like themselves, um, you get this more and more characteristic um, distinction in the brain. That is really cool. I am personally a classically trained musician and can't even begin to fathom how much is going on in the brain of jazz musicians at any given time. Sometimes the music is actually written on the page and other times it's just like you said, a roadmap and they have to improvise on top of it and come up with their own music that goes along with the right patterns and keys of music. And, and that is um, something as a classically trained musician that I would not be able to do if it was put in front of me. If it's not a melody or a, you know a line of music on a page, my classically trained brain wouldn't know what to do. Same here. I'm also like that, right? Classically trained. And if you, if you take away the music, I'm not sure what to do. Um, and I think that that is part of, so much part of the training. And, and what we're seeing I mean, is also that when I hear something slightly unexpected, right? I, or when I hear myself play, right? At first, I, I find that to be really unbearable. Um, and I feel like I'm always picking out the mistakes and so on. Um, and, and we've also looked at this, right, this sort of cringing that, or, or this, um, this, how the brain treats unexpected sounds, you know, comparing classically trained musicians and jazz trained musicians. Um, and it's quite interesting that when, when we're hearing slightly different, slightly unexpected music, it's still musical, but slightly unexpected, um, the jazz musicians' brains notice the unexpectedness sooner than the classical musicians do. Um, and then, but, uh, but all the brains notice that something is unexpected, even non, non musician people with no musical training can still tell, okay, that's a little bit unusual. And then, but then after that noticing, um, the, the jazz musicians and the non musicians actually go back to baseline. So they've heard it, they accepted it, they are okay with it. But then it's the classical musicians that have this late brain activity where it's as if you're still worrying about the thing that just happened and trying to think, you know, ask yourself if that's a mistake or how can we correct that or, um, or, you know, how does that make you feel? Right? So I think we, it, we're really tapping into different personalities that are probably um, from, from rising from training. And, you know, just speaking as a classically trained violinist myself, I'm, I mean, I really started out in, wanting to understand what is it that makes the jazz musicians do what they do. Um, and in talking to um, jazz professors and also um, doing these experiments, I, I, I really find that so much of it is about how we treat the unexpected, uh, whether we treat it as an opportunity or whether we treat it as a mistake. Um, <laughs> and I think that, that that's been really um, helpful intuition for me um, and just in other areas of life as well, right? right? Right now we're kind of in this situation where everything's a little bit unexpected and your whole environment is unexpected. And, you know, do you treat that as, um, as, a, as a mistake or as something that you have to change um, or do you treat that as an opportunity? So, um, yeah, so I think it's in some way, it's, it's a bit strange to, to think that, you know, this very small corner of music and the brain research can help you learn more about life, but I think it does. So what kind of music are you working on right now to kind of keep it in your life, even though we can't necessarily make music together in person? Yeah, well, I've been turning to songwriting. I've written a song called the Coronavirus Song, um, and that's the first of a few. Um, I have um, started to make videos of myself playing with myself. So I also play the piano and and, um, and the, the little bit of ukulele uh, in addition to violin. And then I'm also engaging in some collaborative projects with friends. Um, so as of today, actually, I just recorded 
um, a little violin um, on top of um, Jenny Zook and, and her husband James Gutierrez. So Jenny is also in the orchestra, of course. Um, they recorded a, a song for in time for Mother's Day. Uh, and I recorded a violin part on top of that. So, you know, some musical collaborations. Uh, I'm hoping to also uh, make a, 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 sound, a, a musical collaboration with my uh, students in my lab, um, who are, of course, all in different places, but um, a lot of them have some musical training and really have a lot to offer. So, yeah, I think treating this as an opportunity to make more music. I should also mention, um, I know that there's a lot of interest in uh, making music especially for you know in, in times of of need right because the the pandemic has has really um, left everyone feeling very socially isolated uh, and so there are these beautiful recording uh, beautiful examples of like Italians singing on balconies and people playing music for each other on the streets and while spatially distanced and so on um, there's also been some um, interest in and making music especially for recovering COVID-19 patients, um, especially in Boston. So the Boston Hope Medical Center that has been um, has recently uh, popped up and is, is this amazing um, temporary hospital, uh, especially for recovering COVID patients. So what, uh, what I'm trying to work on is helping to think about making music especially for these um, these patients, but not in a way that uh, violates their privacy. Right, so it's not like, hey, I'm, I'm a recovering COVID patient, and I'm going to call up a singer-songwriter because that would really um, violate the, the privacy issues. Um, so, um, but still, I mean, there, there's uh, lots of musicians who are really well-trained and, and furloughed right now. Um, and so um, finding a way for them to create music that is um, well-suited to, um, to the, the personality styles and the preferences and the of the interests of these patients. So trying to, um, to use survey tools mostly to, um, to find the different types of listeners there are and, the, and match them up with the different singer songwriters so that we can, um, we can more effectively enable music making for each other um, at this time. I'm fascinated by the Boston Hope Hospital. Dr. Lisa Wong is also um, helping with the music side of things there yes. where they're really focusing on recovering from COVID as um, more than just physical recovery, um, using the arts, music, um, and uh, things like yoga, mindfulness to really heal yourself as a whole and not just focus on, you know, when can you be discharged? Right, exactly. I think, yeah, so we're definitely um, on the same team, I would say. I think that, um, like my, my role in that especially is as the scientist, right? And as a person who, who respects and wants to kind of, um, kind of cater to the diverse interests and, and, um, and tastes that there are, right? Like the last thing we want to do is blast music on a, and blast classical music in the speaker for, for that hospital. Cause like, um, cause we all know that, a big part of our enjoyment of music is the agency of choosing to listen to the music. Um, and then also not everybody likes classical music, right? I mean, there might be some people who are more hip hop types or who are more country music types. And so, um, so if we can use some scientific tools to, um, to better match music making, do like a music matchmaking, um, and then I think we would just ha have a little bit um, more sensitivity or more, um, I think, effects, um, efficacy in, in getting, um, getting music to, to really work as a form of, of medicine, right? as a form of um, improving well-being. So I also want to talk a little bit about um, you as a Longwood Symphony musician. So how long have you been in the orchestra? Oh, many years. So I started in 2007 um, and I played almost every season until 2013 when I moved to Connecticut and then I only played maybe one season a year and then I had a, my daughter um, in 2015 and then I think I didn't play for maybe a, a year and a half or two years since then 
Um, but so, and, and then I moved back to to um, to Boston for for uh, my current position, and that was 2018. And I've been playing in more concerts since then. So, yeah. So uh, I guess it's been altogether um, 13 years. Yes, um, 12 or 13 years. But then with the hiatus in between. So what is it about playing in the orchestra that keeps you coming back each season? I think it's the people. Yeah. And I think it's um, the music itself. I mean, I find that, um, you know, this whole process of getting together and practicing, working on something together and striving for as good a sound as we can make together every week to be really um, enjoyable and really, really therapeutic. Uh, I find the the members to be really fun to hang out with and interact with um, and always very interesting. Um, yeah, and I think musically it's it's just such a good cause. I mean, it's not only are we making music that we enjoy, um, we're also you know, um, raising awareness and raising funds for um, for a different um, uh, different medical causes. And I, and I, I think that's really um, really important and, and that makes Longwood quite unique. Um, and I would say that um, it's sort of my my primary go to um, extracurricular um, activity and, and experience, and is um, it's something I'm very proud of. We're of course happy to have you as part of the orchestra, um, but now that you are stuck at home, um, having to socially distance, what are you doing to keep yourself? um entertained or sane yeah so i wrote this coronavirus song uh, and i wrote another song called the weird toast song so my, my husband likes to make weird toasts uh, he likes to um put different strange ingredients on toast sometimes they, they range from something not so unusual like marshmallows and uh peanut butter and um, to something quite unusual like oh like wasabi and um, what's another? Uh, so we had a friend bring us some ants that are actually a food source, like in some countries. So um, so we had some ants on that. That was a controversial one. Um, yeah, um, so he makes these weird toasts and he likes to post them on Facebook every day. And I wrote a song about weird toasts. It's called the Weird Toast Song. Um, you know, so, so making little songs. And I, I made a song for my students once. Uh, mainly to encourage them to stay creative and I mean my, my job title is as assistant professor of creativity and creative practice which really maybe it's because I study creativity as part of my research so so the work about jazz improvisation counts as that um, you know so I really spend a lot of time thinking about how why we have creativity and what's it good for and, and I think you know being stuck at home um, and just needing to find something to do, well, that's a really good reason to, to encourage all forms of creativity. Um, yeah, I mean, cooking, um, spending time with my daughter. Um, I'm still doing the, the, us the usual acad academic work, um, interacting with students and writing, working, pap working on papers, analyzing data, all of those things. But yeah, but I've picked up all sorts of, of hobbies. Um, I'm playing the keyboard a lot more now. I'm playing the ukulele a lot more. Uh, I still play play the violin a lot, of course. And then, yeah, um, I, I knitted a scarf, um, doing lots of drawings as well, especially with my daughter. Um, so yeah, lots of fun things to, to keep myself entertained. <laughs> You've really you? covered like the whole spectrum of creativity. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet there's a lot of um, playing music, but also a lot of food related um, innovations. Yeah, definitely. You've, you've done it all. <laughs> <laughs> so Psyche, is there um, anything else that you want to add or any suggestions or advice that you might have for anyone else? Well, I think it's um, my personal um, advocacy these days has become yeah, make more music you know I, I think music making has been has always been a way to keep ourselves grounded and sane and also bonded um, I've actually been working on a paper on the evolutionary um, kind of goal of, of, uh, of music and social bonding being that goal I, I think music very much evolved um, to bring people together 
Um, and, and you can see that across all cultures. Um, and you can see that in the way music evolved over the centuries. Um, and I think that now is, I mean, it, it's just really become uh, an especially important time to show how uh, through music we can um, reduce that, that social distance, even though physically we're, we're not close together. Um, I think that it is a way, uh, we are using music as an auditory channel towards each other's social and emotion areas of the brain. So um, yeah, so I think that my, my main um, advocacy for, for everybody is um, to keep making music and enjoying it. Well, thank you. I personally am going to now definitely go sit at the piano and make some music tonight. Yay. Great to hear it. Your advocacy Same is here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Psyche, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat and tell us more about your work and what you've got going on. And um, it's really great to hear what you're doing. Thank you. Yes, it's been great chatting with you. And I can't wait to hear from more of uh, the fellow LSO members as well. Me as well. I look forward to many more interviews to come. Well, thank you again. And stay safe. Wash your hands. Stay, stay away from other people. Yes. <laughs> yes. Stay safe. Okay. See you Bye. later. Bye-bye. Thank you.